So going from a completely insignificant name, Gideon, the woodcutter, now he has identity in standing against these false gods which have permeated the nation of Israel and standing up for the Lord, the one true God. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Faith Ministries. I'm Chris Jack, and we're starting a new series today that is called Character Studies. Character Studies, and uh, this is going to be looking at different Bible characters, different people throughout the scriptures. Uh, it's pretty awesome to consider these people, and they were really no different than you or me. Um, people who were walking along, struggling with the curse of sin, trying to understand uh, the nature of who God is, what was their their purpose, um, how to relate to other people, how to wrestle and deal with the, the problems and the difficulties of this life, and particularly people whose faith was, was so strong and who the Holy Spirit was able to do such a powerful work in. But we'll also look at some who refused the influence of the Holy Spirit as well. And today we are going to start with one of my favorite Bible characters. You know him, you love him. His name is Gideon. Now, the story of Gideon takes place about 40 years after the time of Deborah, and it comes in the book of Judges. Now, the book of Judges is a really interesting book. Um, it's really a powerful book because it's very relatable to you and to me. Sometimes as Christians, we look at the people of the Old Testament, the Israelites, and we're like, ah, oh, man, they really, they couldn't get it together. They were always, you know, going against God's will, going against God's ways over and over and over. And this is the cycle of the book of Judges. It comes uh, at a time before Israel had kings, as you would uh, understand them to be, and Israel was in the, the promised land, but because when Joshua led the people into the promised land after the time of Moses, they didn't wipe out all of the, the people groups that were there the way that God asked them to do. They left many of them there, and so there were, there were these constant uh, uprisings of these different people groups within the promised land who would attack Israel and would persecute them. And of course, this happened because of their original disobedience to God. Um, and so this is the cycle of the book of Judges. Uh, there would be a nation that would rise up and would oppress the Israelites and, and they would suffer for a time and then they would repent uh, of their evil and worshiping false gods. They would turn back, they would worship God again, and God would, would send judges to, to help them and to assist them um, in order to, to be free once again. And so this is the cycle. We look in Judges chapter 6, verse 1. We see Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Now, Midian just means strife. And this is a great uh, name for the Midianites, of course, because they were a very cruel people. As we see in Judges chapter 6, verse 2, uh, they were so cruel that the Israelites would hide out. They would they would hide in mountains and caves and, and strongholds. And whenever Israel would uh, plant crops, marauders from Midian would come from the east and would attack them. They would leave nothing for the people to eat. They would destroy all the crops. They would take all of the animals. And the Bible says these enemy hordes were as thick as locusts. And they arrived on droves of camels, too many to count. They stripped the land until it was bare. And so we see Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. And don't you know that it is the, the low points of our lives that cause us to cry out to the Lord. And God uses this strife, he uses this suffering to, to help the people to come back to him. And the Bible says, then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Isn't this so much like us, though? We, we constantly have to be reduced to spiritual starvation, to emotional starvation, to physical starvation, until our bodies are withering away or our, our spirits are just totally broken, or until we are in just the pit of despair and covered with, with shame and guilt, until we finally realize the error of our ways and that we don't really have it all together and we really can't handle the things that are on our plate. And then we cry out to God for help, and He is always there to, to receive us. <laughs> He's always there to accept us back into his loving arms with forgiveness and mercy and grace. Well, in Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 12, we see the angel of the Lord coming to Gideon. 
the angel of the Lord, which is the the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ before he was given the name Jesus, um, represented as the angel or messenger of God. And he comes to Gideon and he finds Gideon hiding on the threshing floor. And he says to him, Gideon, mighty warrior. This is so ironic because Gideon is hiding out. He's afraid of the Midianites. And, and he's gone down into this place where they would grind the grain down the threshing floor, um, and, he, and he's hiding from the enemy. But yet, the angel of the Lord comes to him and, and calls him mighty warrior. It kind of seems like a paradox. It kind of seems like an oxymoron. Well, don't you know that God calls things not as they are, but as they will be? Not as they are, but as they will be. I love this about God, and I love this about the story of Gideon, because God saw Gideon not as who he was, a coward hiding there from his enemies, but he saw him as the mighty warrior that he was going to be one day through the power of the Holy Spirit. God sees you, and he sees me, not just as we are in this this broken state, but as who we will be in Christ and what we will accomplish through his power, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Gideon's response um, is telling, he says, Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? This is so common even today. You know, where is God? What happened to the stories of old? And he goes on, didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? He's heard the stories of the, of the plagues on Egypt and the Red Sea and the, the walls of Jericho coming down. But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Now, let me tell you today that the trial doesn't come in God's absence. The trial comes in God's presence. See, Gideon thought that everything bad was happening because the Lord wasn't with them. But in reality, God was allowing those bad things to come, bad things, that he was allowing the trials, the tribulations to come upon the people of Israel because he was right there with them. And he was trying to draw them back into to the spiritual place that they should have been the entire time. That's why the book of James chapter 1, verse 3 says, The testing of your faith produces perseverance. And he goes on to say, Let perseverance, the testing of your faith, let it finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Do you want to be a mature Christian? Do you want to be a complete person, a a complete Christian, not lacking anything, not lacking any good thing? Well, you have to let the test come. You have to let the trial come. You have to let perseverance finish its work. Because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 that the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. The Lord was with Gideon. The Lord was with Israel. Even in the midst of their disobedience, he was bringing, as a good father brings discipline, he was bringing discipline upon his people to turn them back to him. And so we read on in verse 14, then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have. Now, you got to love this. He didn't ask Gideon to conjure up something that he didn't possess already. He said, take what you have, take the measure of strength that you have, and rescue Israel from the Midianites, for I am sending you. Now, this was a big ask because Midian had about 135,000 soldiers in their army, and Israel had only about 32,000 fighting men. And so very naturally, Gideon cries out, but Lord, but Lord, these could be the the two words that kind of encapsulate uh, or paraphrase a lot of the times in our lives, but Lord, I don't understand. And so that's what he says. He says, but Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. You think God didn't know this? I love Gideon. I I, I resonate so much with his character because Gideon knows he's the least. He's, He's part of the smallest, the least important tribe, and he's the least important of the least important tribe. 
But see, that's what's so beautiful. God recognized Gideon's humility. He knew that he would be usable. He knew that he would be a vessel that could be used to magnify the glory and the power of God. God doesn't call the qualified people. He qualifies those whom he calls. And you can trust in that. You can take solace. You can have rest. You can have peace. You can have assurance in knowing that you don't have to conjure something up that that's more than what you have. You just have to rest in the authority and the power and the calling of the Holy Spirit. And that's what God says to Gideon here. The Lord said to him, I will be with you. And check this out. You will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Wow. You say, but God, I can't. He says, my presence is enough. But God, you just don't understand that. He says, my presence is enough. I don't understand, God. I'm confused. I'm afraid. This doesn't make sense. My presence is enough. It's enough. You know, the name uh, Emmanuel, during the Christmas season, you hear this name a lot. Um, he, sh- he shall be called Emmanuel, right? It means God with us. You know, this really hit me one time as I, was, uh, as I was studying the Hebrew language in order to understand Scripture more, and I'm certainly by no means an expert in Greek or Hebrew, but I do love studying those languages so that I can understand the Bible a little bit more. And it takes a lifetime to become an expert in a language like that, and, and even many experts still disagree on the nature of some words and some cultural differences. So sometimes you really got to dig in and research um, and do your, your, your diligence uh, to see what they're saying about certain things. But the name Emmanuel, when I sat down once and I'm just, and I'm looking at that word and I'm studying it, it just, it just hit me all at once. God is with us. He's with us. That that would be his name. That he would choose that his son, when he came to earth, would bear the name Emmanuel. He would identify with a name that says that he is with you and that he is with me. And that's what he tells Gideon. It's what he tells his people over and over. He told Moses, he told Abraham, I will be with you. And you know, I love Gideon. Look what look how he replies here in verse 17. If you are truly going to help me. Show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. You got to love this guy. <laughs> he's just, he needs, he needs more. He needs affirmation. He needs a sign. And so we look at Judges chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. And Gideon, he goes to, to prepare a, a little meal and to bring a sacrifice. And when he brings it back to the angel of the Lord, we see that fire comes down from heaven and, and licks up the sacrifice. It eats up everything. And then the angel of the Lord disappears. Now Gideon totally freaks out here because he says, I will surely die. I have seen God. He knows that this interaction with the angel of the Lord was an interaction with God, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, before he actually had the name Jesus Christ. We see him in theophanies appearing to different people throughout the scripture. And so what does Gideon do? He builds an altar and he calls the place Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. Isn't that wonderful? Gideon, who was cowering, who was hiding, Uh, down on the threshing floor from his enemies, the Midianites. Probably a man filled with with anxiety and worry constantly, just the way that we see him and his questions. You can can rightfully assume that probably. And he names this place, Yahweh Shalom, the Lord is peace. Amazing. And so we get to the next part of the story, which truly reveals Gideon's heart. And a lot of people know about Gideon. They know the story of how he fleeced God and he wanted God to do like he tested God, right? He wanted him to do like a supernatural test to have the fleece be dry and then have the fleece be wet with the ground around it be the opposite. And a lot of people know that. But what people don't check out is this this passage right before that. 
And so if you want to check out the video that I uh, that I made on whether or not it's okay to test God or when is it okay to test God, go ahead and click this link right here and you'll be able to check it out. But what I want you to understand is this passage right here comes before the fleecing, comes before Gideon asks to test God. So keep that in mind as we read this. That night, the Lord said to Gideon, the Lord wastes no time. It is that night that he moves. And he says, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old, pull down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole. So a couple of things here. First of all, the bull was like the prized animal. It's the most expensive animal. It's not uh, one that is just, you know, it doesn't mean a lot to us because most of us don't own cattle. Um, But this is a big deal. It's his father's prized bull. And, and he says, pull down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asher pole standing beside it. So we know that at his father's house or wherever this was, his father had altars to false gods. He has an altar to Baal, who from the day um, was just a wicked, detestable god, had to do with child sacrifices and, and fertility and, um, you know, all, all kinds of things. And then the Asher pole, which stood beside it. And so this was at his father's place. And then what does God say to do? He says, build an altar to your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully. Sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar and use as fuel the wood of the Asherah pole you cut down. This is a big thing that God is asking Gideon to do. He's asking him to put his life on the line, go and desecrate his father's altars to these false gods, and to burn up his father's prized bull on a new altar that he builds to the Lord, using as fuel for it the rubble from the other altars to the false gods that he's torn down. And in the community, to tear down these altars to Baal would be deserving of death, and we'll see that here just in a minute in the scriptures. So God asks Gideon, to be obedient to the point where he lays his life down on the line, goes against his family. He asks him to to step out in faith in a huge way here. We cannot miss that. And in verse 27, So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord commanded, but he did it at night because he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. You You gotta realize here that Gideon... Is just like you and he's just like me. It's like, okay, God, I'll do what it is that you said to do, but I'm going to find a way to do it where I have like as little confrontation as possible. And so he goes and he does it under the cover of night and he brings with him 10 other people so he's not by himself, right? <laughs> I love it. Okay, and in verse 28, early the next morning, As the people of the town began to stir, you know how it is, everyone's waking up, everyone's getting their day going, and wait a second, someone discovered that the altar of Baal had been broken down and that the Asherah pole beside it had been cut down, and in their place a new altar had been built, and on it were the remains of the bull that had been sacrificed. So the people said to each other, who did this? And after asking around and making a careful search, they learned that it was Gideon son of Joash. Bring out your son, the men of the town demanded of Joash. He must die for destroying the altar of Baal and for cutting down the Asher pole. Now, this is a pivotal moment. Uh, It's a pivotal moment for Gideon. His life is on the line, of course, but it's also a pivotal moment for his father, Joash. See, his father has been swept away with the, uh, the worshiping false gods and idolatry that the rest of Israel has been swept away in during this time. And he has an opportunity here to either stand up with his son, Gideon has provided the opportunity by being obedient to the Lord, where Joash doesn't have to do it on his own. So Joash can either stand up for and with his son, or he can go along with the mob, with the crowd. And you see today all over the world, you see it in American politics, uh, you see it in religion. The mob has a, a great influence. The mob, it's a mindless mentality. It's a mentality of, of violence, and, and, and it, it doesn't think about the consequences of its actions or how these things will affect other people. And that's what he's facing here, a mob of angry people. So what's he going to do? We read in verse 31, But Joash shouted to the mob that confronted him, 
Why are you defending Baal? Will you argue his case? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. So he flips the whole thing around. If Baal is truly God, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. From then on, Gideon was called Jerubbabel, which means let Baal defend himself because he broke down Baal's altar. Wow, what an awesome moment for Gideon, an awesome moment for Joash, his father. We see things in the story at this point begin to turn. Something really cool about this, Gideon, the name Gideon, is pretty insignificant. It means one who cuts wood. One who cuts wood. This was Gideon's identity before his encounter with the Lord and before his response of obedience to God. His name is then changed to Jerubbabel, which means let Baal defend himself. So going from a completely insignificant name, Gideon, the woodcutter, now he has identity in standing against these false gods which have permeated the nation of Israel and standing up for the Lord, the one true God. Grace, the Lord's grace, fostered obedience within Gideon, and that obedience fostered purpose. God's grace poured out upon Gideon, giving him an opportunity to respond in obedience. It fostered that obedience within him, and and that obedience fostered a sense of purpose within Gideon to accomplish the things that the Lord had set forth. And so we see in Judges chapter 6, verse 34, the Spirit of the Lord took possession of Gideon. And you say, well, what does that mean? That's kind of ambiguous. Well, the NLT um, is a translation that that tries to focus on the idea of what's being said in the phrase. Um, The NIV tries to do more of a a direct word-for-word translation, so the words are really close, but sometimes the full idea of the sentence can be a little ambiguous or lost. The NLT, like here in this verse, tries to get the idea of the whole sentence, the the whole verse, the whole phrase, but sometimes the individual words can be a little confusing because of that. Young's literal translation gives the verse, which is very, very direct, literal idea of this verse. It says, And the Spirit of Jehovah hath clothed Gideon. I really love that idea, that picture, this illustration that's given from this verse. When a person is clothed, you see the clothing that they're wearing and not what's underneath. Thank God, am I right? (laughs) That's the idea of this verse here. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, came and clothed Gideon so that people no longer saw the Gideon of old. They saw the Jerubbabel that now existed because of the Spirit of God. When they looked at Gideon, they saw the Holy Spirit. That's so awesome. I pray that for myself. I pray that for you as well, that when people look at us, they see the Spirit of God, not the old self, not the old Chris, not not me with all my faults and all my failures and all my flaws and my pride and my selfishness and all of those things. I pray that that through obedience to God, that they will see the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not just upon my life, but but clothing me from the inside out. That is my prayer. In uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 34, we keep reading, Gideon blows the ram's horn as a call to arms, and the men of the clan of Abiezer came to him. He also sent messengers throughout Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, summoning their warriors, and get this, all of them, all of them responded. The clothing of the Holy Spirit rallies the troops of God. Do you know anyone like this? Are you a person like this? Does your love and your passion for the Lord inspire other people as a call to arms to join you in the spiritual battle for the kingdom of God? Or have you been sidelined by the enemy's tactics of self-indulgence and apathy, prosperity that comes in this country, or the dilution of the gospel, the false prosperity gospel of our day? or the apostasy of our modern age. See, we look at Israel and we say, oh, apostasy, they forgot God. They, they left God behind. They, they rejected God. And we look at 
our, at our age and we say, oh yeah, that doesn't happen. Yeah, we have the Bible, we sing worship songs, we, we, we go to church, we have all these things. Well, Israel had many of those things as well. They, they had the scriptures, they had the temples um, the, and tabernacle that was set up to worship God. Uh, they had you know, opportunities all the while to sing, to worship, to praise God. But they also had the touch of idolatry and false gods slowly creeping in. And so they didn't realize that what they were doing was apostasy until the Lord brought the discipline. I pray that you and I don't have to face that same thing, that the the hand of discipline from God. I pray that we can learn and be corrected before our lives have to be completely turned upside down like the people of Israel. But you know what? God is good. He is loving. He's a he's a good father. He disciplines his children um, properly. You know, not an ounce more than is necessary and not an ounce less than is necessary. So we keep reading in Judges chapter 6, verse 36 and through verse 40. I'm just going to paraphrase this for us. Um, Gideon, basically, this is the, the fleecing uh, that you know of. And he basically says, God, okay, look, if you're truly going to rescue us like you promised, then prove it to me in this way. Now, a lot of people, they get this wrong because they don't read the context of how Gideon has already responded in obedience um, and in faith to God, even at risk of his own life, against his own family, against the people of the town, uh, and, and laying his life on the line in obedience to God. So this is why God receives the test from Gideon, because Gideon has already responded in obedience. He isn't testing God before he chooses to obey. He's chosen to obey, and now he's testing God because he's just frightened. He's not. He, he's unsure of things, and God is asking a huge thing of him here, something that seems on a human level totally impossible. You know, it would be one, even, even if he had all the men of, of Israel, it would be Every man would have to kill 10 men to make the battle even. And it's just never going to happen. I mean, all of the odds were stacked against him. So he asked God, he says, okay, first what I want you to do is I want to put this fleece out on the ground, uh, a sheepskin. And in the morning, I want the fleece to be wet, but the, all the ground around it to be dry. So basically there's dew only on the fleece, but not on the ground. Supernatural. It wouldn't happen without some supernatural intervention. Uh, and so God does it. Isn't that amazing? Gideon requests this, and God actually does it. But then it's not enough for Gideon. <laughs> and again, I love Gideon's character. It's so relatable, is it not? It's like, okay, God, give me a sign. And then you open your Bible, and it's like, whoa, the word just speaks to you so clearly. Or or you turn on you know, a YouTube sermon or something like that, and you listen, and the preacher is like, they're speaking right to you. Or you go to church, they're speaking right to you. You're driving down the road, and like you see a, a I don't know, a bumper sticker, a billboard, a license plate. It's like, God is speaking right to you. You know what I'm talking about. And then you're like, uh, could have been coincidence. God, maybe if you could do this, or maybe if you could speak this particular way. <laughs> That's exactly what Gideon does here. And so he says, Lord, don't be mad at me. I love that. God, don't be mad at me. But if you could just do this one more thing, one more time, just in case it was coincidence, maybe tonight, I'm going to put the fleece out again and don't be angry. But this time I want the fleece to be dry and all the ground around it to be wet. And you know what? God does it. God does it. How faithful, how kind, how how beautiful, how patient is our God. You know, this has a little bit of of um kind of prophetic imagery here in the sense that the fleece is kind of like God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. Um, and the ground around it is like all of the Gentiles, basically, uh, all the other people who are not part of the bloodline of Israel. And at that time, um, the the dew, the Holy Spirit, had been poured out on the nation of Israel only, you know. And we see this throughout the Old Testament. Although there was opportunity for people like Rahab, a prostitute in Jericho, to come to the Lord, the influence of the Holy Spirit still existed for all people. Uh, that's why in the book of Peter, the Bible says that he went and preached to the spirits in prison at the time of the flood, meaning that people for all time have had the opportunity to respond to the Holy Spirit. But the, the Holy Spirit had been poured out specifically on the nation of Israel for the purpose of taking the, the message, the gospel, out 
to the entire earth. Um, if you want to learn more about this, go ahead and click this video right here, which is answers the question, is Israel still God's chosen people? And so that's the idea of the fleece being wet, but the ground being dry. But then it reverses because later on what happened was Jesus said to the nation of Israel, my house is left unto you desolate because they had rejected the Messiah. God rejected them, not individually, meaning no Jew can be saved. That's ridiculous. But as a nation, they were no longer uh, the trustees of the gospel. They were no longer the, the sole uh, bearers of the responsibility of taking out the word of God to the nations. And, and the Gentiles became the ones who were entrusted with that, as we see from Paul's writings. And so the fleece then was dry and the Holy Spirit was poured out um, at the time of Pentecost and, and after that, of course, in the book of Acts on Gentiles on the ground around the fleece. So just a little bit of interesting uh, significance there for you as we're going through this study. Next, we look at Judges chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. So Gideon gets up early the next morning. I love that. He doesn't wait. It's the next morning. He gets right up, and God says, you have too many. You have too many. <laughs> and Gideon's like, okay, wait a second. I see all of these men. I see 32,000 troops here. All the, all the men of Israel. And I'm thinking this is not enough because Midian has 130 plus thousand. Sometimes God reduces the things that we think are necessary in order to teach us not to rely upon them. You ever had a financial situation where your finances were reduced for whatever reason, maybe a loss of a job or something like that? And when that happens, when, when that's cut away, you begin to cut away your spending, right? Just because you can't afford all the things maybe that you afforded before. And you realize, wow, I can really do without a lot of the things that I had before that I thought were necessary. Well, this is what God does with his people. God looks at what, what we have and he, and he cuts away all of the extra. And he shows us that all we need really is him. So Gideon says to his people, he says, any of you who are, who are afraid or scared, go ahead and go home. And 22,000 men, 68% leave and only 10,000 remain. So now we've gone from impossible odds to even more impossible odds. 68% of what was already a small number leave. How do we respond when people leave? When people leave the church, when people leave our lives, when people leave the, the spiritual battlefield and they give up, they throw in the towel, how do we respond? Do we cower in fear? Do we say, oh Lord, this is not enough? And so God speaks again. We got 10,000 men now, right? And God says, there are still too many. <laughs> still too many. 10,000 men, God, uh, there's still too many. So he says, divide them into two groups and um, keep those who drink the water up from their hands, but those who kneel down and lap the water up with their tongue, um, send them home. And so 9,700, another 30% leave, leaving about 300 men, less than 1% of the original number to go to battle against Midian. Now God says, you know what? I can work with this. I can work with this. You see, even at 32,000, maybe some military might or genius could, could, you know, help Israel to win the battle. Maybe some kind of advantage, some human wisdom or discernment about the battle or, or, or some kind of, you know, intel or, or something that they could, have, they could have used to still win the battle. See, the disadvantage, it, it, it was bad, but maybe not totally impossible, right? 300, the only way they're winning that battle is by the power of God. And that's what God wants. That's what he wanted. He said, I can work with this because, because the Bible says that his power is made perfect in our weakness. If we're strong, if we have our own might, there's no room for God to work. 
If you're perfect, you got it all together. You got the money. You got you got the talent. You got everything you need. You got the looks and just the whole package. You don't need God. What do you need God for? Is what we think. Of course, we're all sinners. We're all broken. But we think I don't need God. I can I can handle this. I got it. And it's not until we're broken down that we realize, whoa, wait a second. I need the power of God in my life. And so that's where he brings Israel. The Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. But I love this. Story doesn't end here. (laughs) That night, the Lord said, he says to Gideon, get up, go down into the Midianite camp for I have given you victory over them. And you're like, whoa, wait a second. So Gideon, he's fixing to just go walk right down into the middle of the enemy's camp? Yes. (laughs) But God knows that he's still afraid. And so he says, but if you are still afraid, I've given you the victory. You don't need to be afraid. But if you're still afraid, he calls out what he already knows is, is living within Gideon, his fear. If you're still afraid, go down to the camp with your servant Pura. Listen to what the Midianites are saying and you will be greatly encouraged. Then you won't be afraid anymore. You'll be eager to attack. So Gideon took Pura, went down to the edge of the enemy camp. Gideon creeps up, and uh, he, he overhears a conversation between two Midianite soldiers. And one is telling of a dream that he had of a loaf of barley tumbling down a hill and crushing a tent. And the other soldier looks at the soldier who was sharing this dream as Gideon is listening quietly in the shadows. And he says, this dream can only mean one thing, that God has given Gideon victory over Midian and its allies. Whoa. And he realizes that what God promised is already happening. Already the soldiers of Midian are living in in terror, are living in fear, are having dreams about God giving Gideon victory over them, even though he only has 300 men, completely outmatched. And what does he do? Gideon bows down in worship. Right there where he's at, in the middle of the Midianite army, he bows down in worship. The revelation of God humbled Gideon to bow in worship even in the midst of the enemy's camp. So what do we read? Then he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, Get up, for the Lord has given you victory over the Midianites. And in Judges chapter 7, verses 16 through 20, we see three groups of soldiers are broken up, probably about 100 each. They're given horns in their right hand, uh, like trumpets, and clay jars with torches in them in the left hand. And the Bible says just after midnight, they blow the horns and they break the jars, revealing the light that is inside, um, and they shout. They give a shout of victory. And then the Bible says, each man stood at his position around the camp and fought to the death? No. And watched. Each man stood at his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in a panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the 300 Israelites blew their ram's horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords those who were not killed, fled. All the men of Israel had to do was be still and watch God work. All Gideon had to do was trust that God would do the thing that he said he would do. I hope you can take a lesson from Gideon in your life. I know I have so many lessons. Be still and wait for God to work. Trust that God will do what he said he's going to do. The Bible says all his promises are yes and amen. He has promised you a seat at the the banquet feast of God in heaven. If you will just submit your life to him and just walk in faith. Sometimes it's hard to trust. Sometimes it's hard to believe. 
Sometimes it's hard to, to have faith. Sometimes it's hard to be still. This is what God calls us to do. It's, it's nothing complicated, but it's difficult, you know? It's, it's not that God calls us to do something complex. It's very simple what he calls us to do, but that doesn't make it easy. So I pray that in your life today, I pray that in my life today, we will learn to be still and wait on God to work, that we will learn to have trust and to have faith, that he is who he says he is, that he is the God of Israel, that he is the God of Gideon, that he is the God of you and of me today. May he bless you today and always. Thank you so much for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell and click all so you receive updates when we post new videos in the future. If you want to watch another one from the topical series, go ahead and click here. If you want to watch a video from our prophecy series, click here. May God bless you today and always. We'll see you next time.